The first hour of Crisis on Infinite Earths is in the books, and there is a lot to talk about, from killer crossovers to unexpected partnerships to the death of Green Arrow to the birth of a new Green Arrow, man. The highs, the lows, and everything in between. All that and more right now on Crisis Aftermath. Welcome to Crisis Aftermath. I'm your host, Kevin Smith. Boy, oh boy, man, we knew that this year's crossover event was gonna be something special, but this is beyond bonkers, man. Here to help me figure it all out, our executive producer, Mark Guggenheim, writer, comedian, and DC nerd, Danny Fernandez, and Arrow star, Kat McNamara. Thanks so much for joining us, everybody. I just wanna ask right off the bat, and you don't count, because you wrote this. <laughs> what were your favorite moments so far? Oh, goodness, there's so many. I mean, mine was when Mia got her her suit. I mean, it was so precious. It was such a precious moment. I You're said, not just saying it because she's sitting right. there. No, it was no. a legit I mean, good moment. I'm saying it because I talk a lot about father-daughter moments in therapy. And so <laughs> <laughs> yeah. I said it like, you know, this is a safe place in front yeah. of millions of people, so I don't mind openly weeping. For sure. I mean, that was one of my favorite moments to shoot, definitely. Just because Steven and I have spent most of the season together, right. and getting to watch him work and, and being a part of the story, this being my first crossover, that was such a big moment, I think, for both characters, and we really felt that. Um, do you watch him? How does one play the daughter of somebody who's been playing a guy for like many seasons? Do you actually go back, watch episodes, and be like, I could steal that, I could steal that? That's exactly what I did. When I first auditioned, I didn't know that I was auditioning for his daughter. Um, and once I found that out, I went back and watched the entire series, because not only is he such an iconic character, but Felicity Smoke is another iconic character. Totally. And Mia is sort of the perfect amalgamation of them both. And I, I tried to steal as many little nuances and, and character quirks as I could to really make her her own person. Mm, you nailed it. Let me ask you this, Mark. You are the architect of all this madness, so you definitely have a favorite moment. I would say in hour one, when Lois and kal oh. place baby Jonathan oh, in so the rocket ship, and I remember we were in the writer's room. We, we assemble a writer's room for the crossover, and we were in the writer's room, and I forget who pitched it. It wasn't me. I wish I could take credit for it. <laughs> But I love it, and I love it for two reasons. Number one, it's homaging, obviously, Alexander Luther uh, being launched, uh, you know, in a rocket ship, baby Alexander Luther being launched in a rocket ship in the first crisis. From crisis, from the book. Uh, but also, uh, Kal-El and Lois are speaking Marlon Brando's dialogue from <laughs> Superman the movie. How fun was that to be able to, and, and was that the marching orders in the writer's room? like? homage, or as other people say, steal as yes. much from other <laughs> sources as possible? You know, it's funny. It, what was so great was no one ever had to be told it. Mm -hmm. We all just instinctively were like, okay, we're gonna steal this, and we're gonna steal this, and we're gonna homage that, and we're gonna tip our hats to this. And it, it was just something we all, we've been doing it, honestly, ever since year one of Arrow. Yeah. Like, it's always been part of the DNA of all these shows. But yeah, I mean, because this is crisis, and because it's the, you know, one of the biggest DC events ever, we felt an obligation to really, like, go for it. It's the show, all the Arrowverse shows have always been about incredible fan service, but this especially feels like they're gonna love this. They're gonna <laughs> love this. So we're all still reeling from an incredible hour of television, but that hour was months and years and actually decades in the making, man. Check it out. So a day in the life of shooting this crossover is, is absolutely staggering in terms of the amount of cast that's coming in and people from other shows. There's so much logistically that goes into it and everybody just has to be on it. This crisis is such a big deal. It's so many actors, so many lines, so many characters, so many moving pieces. You get picked up so early in the morning and you have to go through hair and makeup and then we start acting and then, you know, halfway through a day, you get driven to a different show. Hey! Everyone works very differently. Every production has its own kind of culture and way of working. And when you work with actors from a different production, you get to see ways, you know, that they may do things better or that we may do things better. And so it's a great learning say, experience. Oh. Cut, awesome. Come on, man. Like, just <laughs> seeing that many people walking around in costume. When I was a kid, you dreamed about that. Like, we had Batman and Robin growing up with oh. the great Burt Ward and Adam West. And when you saw those two in their outfits, it made you excited. You dreamed about it. I remember there was a TV guide cover from like 1989 when John Wesley's ship Flash was on yeah. that showed a picture of him in the outfit 
next to a picture of Michael Keaton in the Batman outfit from the movies, next to Christopher Reeve wearing the Superman suit, and you dreamed, like, will there ever be a day where you can see something like this? And we're literally seeing it here unfold in front of us. It's insanity. I mean, I, the 10-year-old me still can't believe it. I mean, I, I'm... The, the fact that that anyone has done this, much less us, the fact that anyone's done this is so exciting to me. It just, it, it scratches every itch as a fanboy I have. And that's the thing, like, you were talking about, like, you know, the fan service. The reason these shows are so fan service oriented is we're fans. We approach it yeah. as fans. And so even, yes, of course, in the writer's room, we're talking about, like, oh, this is going to make them stand up and applaud. But before we get there, we're standing up and applauding ourselves. And we're right. like, oh, my God, this is going to be so awesome. You must be oh, sitting there, guys, oh, going, like, oh, we're yeah. so clever. Yeah, we're so clever. <laughs> <laughs> I did have a question, though, because Burt Ward and Robert Wool are in this. Does that mean that their movies and shows are canonic? a part yeah, of this that's universe. that's the whole point. Like, that it's, and, and they're now canonically so, destroyed. But so <laughs> the, <laughs> yeah. no. We had them for a second, and then gone. So the bat nipples <laughs> existed in this universe. Yes. 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 The bat nipples Look, are our reverse canon. And it was, it was CW. We always knew nipples were involved somewhere. <laughs> so absolutely, man. Let's talk about the elephant in the room, though. The death of Arrow. Yes. Uh, let's take a look. That's okay, Sarah. This is my destiny. Oh. Barry, you, my friend, are the very best of us. I gave it all up for you and Carl. Mm. What was going through your head, man, when you're sitting there watching that scene where you're watching history happen. Indeed, that was was a historic moment in, in many ways for me personally. It was my first day on set with everyone in the suits. Um, it was my first day wearing my suit on set. So I was so excited. We were just talking about how you know much we all are fans of this and how exciting right. that is. So I was over the moon excited. Then I get to set and I realize, oh, now I have to cry over my dying father. Okay, mm. let me reframe my entire headspace. Um, but it, it was it's just... It's weird, because it's not an outfit that's conducive to crying over a dead father. No. Because it makes you feel action-oriented and want to play. Right, you're ready to go. And then all of a sudden they'll, like, cry. Be exactly. dramatic. Exactly. Also, I have the, you know, the Stephen Amell special boots that are actually Nike sneakers in, you know, inside sneakers of the inside the, uh, the, the superhero boots. That's so the you trick. feel like bouncing around anyway. Right, right. But uh, it, it was so wonderful, and Stephen killed it, and everybody really came together because, you know, Stephen, in, in a sense, was the beginning of this entire universe. He's the, he's the spawn. If you were going to make an analogy to another cinematic universe yes. or something like that, uh, he's the Robert Downey Jr. of this universe. Exactly. This very strong spawn exactly. upon which all of those other shows sprang. Right. And what's so great about that is everybody really came together to honor him and the work he's done to build everything else in that moment. And Stephen absolutely killed it. So it, we, we were all, all a mess. <laughs> Mark, you, you've been there with uh, Arrow since day one. Uh, it's unfair to say, did you always know you were going to kill him? But was yeah. there always an idea that, like, when he goes, he goes? Yeah, I, I think, you know, it's funny. Stephen Amell and I have talked about this numerous times over the years, and we were always of the same opinion, which is Oliver's journey has to end with his death. Mm. Um, so it was always, that was always where we were headed. I think... You know, the type of guy Oliver was before he got marooned on Lian Yu, like, he was a jerk. And, and I've always sort of seen Arrow as a redemption story. Yeah. And, um, you know, this is, he makes the ultimate sacrifice for the ultimate redemption. Um, the, the challenge that we sort of had as we were figuring out the crossover was, we basically, a year ago with Elseworlds, we basically said to the audience, um, Oliver's going to die. Yeah. So you may not be surprised he's dying, but you're certainly surprised he's dying this fast. Yeah, you're like, what? Now? Yeah, now? And it's end of hour one? Yeah. <laughs> you're crazy. There's four more hours to go. That a handoff to me, it was a really special moment where you get presented the suit, and that's, that's everything in this world, man. The hero passing on the mantle to somebody else or giving them their true identity, that's everything. Let's take a look at that scene right now. You wanted to see me? I did. I have something for you. What is it? Only one way to find out. Okay, please tell me you were planning on wearing this. I don't think that that one would fit me. There should always be at least one green arrow. Come on, man. <laughs> you don't even have to have a daughter 
in real life to find that incredibly moving. These shows have always been about family, either the family you come from or the family that you make. Um, what do you think, man? Does, does, does Mia want this responsibility? You know, that's been the toughest kind of struggle for Mia throughout her entire process of being involved in this. You know, she was raised in a world in which vigilantes were villainized. Mm. And she's come full circle with that, having met her father and kind of gotten a, a look into the difficult choices he's had to make. But now she's been through and worked through all of these issues and has a wonderful relationship with her father. She doesn't want the responsibility because she doesn't want to lose him. Right. She knows she can take it on. She knows she's ready for it. But she's finally filled the one missing piece of her life and, and doesn't want to lose that. And, and that's kind of the tragedy is that, yes, there, there always needs to be one green arrow, but there's only one green arrow. So she knows that that's coming to an end. And that's, it's difficult, you know. But also it's, um, Stephen has been so instrumental into passing the torch both on and off screen mm. in this sense. And so that scene meant so much to both of us. I think we were both a little emotional in that moment. So did you have to like learn how to shoot fake arrows? I did, I did. I mean, I, I, you know, I did archery in Girl Scout camp when I was a kid. But, Don't brag, um, man. <laughs> I'm, I'm saying like a day or two, I, Fair it's enough. nothing like this. But we have an amazing <laughs> archery coach on the show who's a master archer and she's the one who trains Steven. Mm. So as soon as I was on the show, they said, all right, you have to learn this too because eventually you're gonna get there. So I went and trained with her and she is the ultimate badass, I tell you. She taught me everything I needed to know. And uh, there are a few scenes though where, where Oliver and Mia do a little bit of training and that's actually coming up um, very shortly. We get so to see that. we do get to see that. And it's it's such a wonderful moment that really bonds the two of them. Because Mia initially was trained by Nissa Al Ghul, who mm. also kind of trained Oliver in a way, and it's 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 a full circle. I remember end of season two, uh, Katrina Law, we, we we're in the, for the big tunnel fight, uh, Nissa Al Ghul is firing arrows like this. And I'm like, Katrina. You're killing me. <laughs> Seriously, every time you do cost. that, you're spending ching, ching, thousands ching, ching, of dollars. Ching, ching. Could you, just a little slower, right. just yeah. a little bit. Help me out, you know. Well, that's funny, because when I was on Supergirl, it was very different. They said, oh, just fire a couple shots here and a couple shots here. I'm used to being on Arrow. I said, okay, well, how many? Because I know there's a, they go, oh, so it, it doesn't matter. Just. Just as many as you can. They're like, this is Krypton, kid. We got <laughs> all, all right. the money. <laughs> I'll just fire off all the arrows. <laughs> I want to thank Kat for joining us, man. You did a great job on the show. You did a great job on the thank panel. You thank much. you so much, man. When we come back, we're going to meet the Monitor and map out the multiverse. All that and more on Crisis Aftermath. Don't quiver, Arrow fans. We'll be right back. Welcome back to Crisis Aftermath. I'm Kevin Smith. As we've mentioned, Crisis on Infinite Earths is one of the biggest events in TV history. But just in case you still don't grasp the scale and scope, here's what the show's stars have to say about it. Check it out. It's huge. We've never seen anything like this on television. Yeah, it's big. It's insane. Uh, unfeasible, unthinkable, absurd, outlandish. I never thought in a million years that they would be able to do a crisis on infinite Earths. Take cover! I don't know if you can actually technically get bigger than Crisis on Infinite Earths. I can handle it. Every hero imaginable is here. It's massive. <laughs> we are making television history. This is never going to happen again. Lots of things are never going to happen again. Joining us now is the man responsible for the biggest crisis ever, the Monitor himself, LaMonica Garrett. Man, hey. how are you? I'm good, man. Thanks for having me. Thank you for being here. The Monitor is arguably one of the most important characters in the DC Universe, okay? How do you handle the pressure of playing a part that big? As a DC fan, you it's easy to get caught up in the magnitude of who he is and what his presence means, but as the actor, I got to focus on his objective and just going after what he needs and what he wants. And how is that, like, as an actor, like, normally you play the objective in a normal world. This guy's objective is cosmic. It's glo It's more than global. It's cosmic. Yeah. It's universes. It's uh, it's the biggest thing I've ever tackled, but it's it's been awesome. What was it like strapping on the costume? It was constricting. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, constricting and, uh, yeah, it, it aesthetics first. Yeah, welcome. As long to the, as it looked, as, you know, as long as it looked the part, it was good. Welcome to the superhero game, where yeah. like your mo your movement is very what limited. Movement? Yes. <laughs> as the monitor man, you're pretty much 
constantly pissing people off. Let's take another look at a pivotal moment with you. Check it out. I spared your friends' lives so they could save their world last year. This is a very different threat. You need to stop playing games with me. You tell me why the Anti-Monitor is doing this. And then tell me how I'm gonna prevent it. Not knowing what you are fighting means you will prepare for every possibility. Because this threat brings with it the annihilation of all life and all realities. Do you now comprehend the scope of the danger we all now face? Something so interesting about the monitor is you never know how much you could trust them, man. Like, how do you approach playing that? I think the writers have take more credit for that, you know, than me, but uh, they write it well, they write him well. But I think anyone that shows up delivering that much bad news with a straight <laughs> face, right. you're not gonna trust them too much. Let me ask you this, when you got cast, did you go out and get the crisis issues? Like, cause monitors on a lot of the covers and whatnot. Were yeah. you like, it's me! I didn't know I got cast as a monitor at first. Really? Yeah, Mark had to tell me like after the fact, but uh, I didn't know who I was reading for. <laughs> Not after you shot the cross. <laughs> no, 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 no. <laughs> You're like, guess what, there. you were the monitor. <laughs> but I, I got crisis, the, I, I was familiar with it as a fan. And when I knew I was the monitor, I went back, got it, reread it. Mm. And then when I was, found out I was playing the anti-monitor, I went back and reread it again with a fresh set of eyes, so very, very yeah. Cool. Well, with all the suiting up that was going on on set, was there any sort of like, hey, no pictures, no pictures? Uh, we're always saying no pictures, no pictures. And uh, as if anyone's been on Twitter, you know how successful we were. <laughs> yeah, all <laughs> pictures, all, all pictures. All pictures all the time. Is there anything you could tell us about the monitor's uh, backstory that maybe we didn't get from the show? Actually, you know, one of the fun things that we're doing, this is a spoiler, this is something we haven't told anybody, is we're gonna open hour four, which is the Arrow Hour, which has come, it's not even on in, until January. Yeah, it's the 2020, we gotta wait for that. We open with the, basically the mother of all flashbacks, and we basically do the secret origin oh. of the monitor and the anti-monitor. Really? Yeah, yeah. and actually that, that whole sequence, the, the first draft, it was actually written by Marv Wolfman. Get out of here, really? Yeah. Oh. yeah. So did he work, has he been working on the shows or did you oh, pull yeah. him in for Crisis? Uh, I pu we pulled him in for the Arrow Hour. He and I co-wrote the Arrow Hour. So it, like for all of us who are like, oh my God, I can't believe they're doing Crisis, his mind must be bent. It, he, he is, he's just been so fantastic and so enthusiastic and, you know, he came in and met with all the writers across all the superhero shows and just sort of held court for two hours, just telling us all about the history of Crisis, the history of DC Comics, I mean, you name it. It was like getting a master class mm. in superheroes from obviously one of the masters. Danny, when, when did Crisis come into your life? As a DC fan, it didn't come in to my collecting until a few years into my collecting when somebody was like, hey, you know how they got to one universe? And then I went back and read it. When did you fall in? It wasn't until I was an adult. And even then I think I had like, I didn't fully grasp the magnitude of it. I'm very fascinated to hear about his origin. I think it'd be funny if they just wrote in like the teenage years <laughs> of the <Yeah>. monitor. <laughs> even though I know that that's like not, but that would be hilarious. I think just, you know. The, ki the kids in high school did give him a lot of crap for his mutton chops, <laughs> as I recall. Yeah. But oddly enough, not the outfit. The outfit, no, no, the outfit was totally, it's funny, actually, we, we give you, in that origin story, we give you an explanation for the outfit. Really? Yeah. Wow. Yeah. What themes were you focused on in Crisis? What did you want to bring out the most in the storytelling? Sacrifice and redemption. Uh, I mean, and pretty much. Geez, uh, I wonder who that's. I know where. Like. <laughs> where did that come from? Yeah. Um, but like, you know, and every character is sort of dealing with that. And I think sort of one of the other sort of sub themes is the concept of passing the torch. Mm. And it's not just the passing of the torch from Oliver to Mia. It's you know, you, you'll sort of see. I don't want to spoil too much, but there, there's a lot of you know, passing of the torch and keeping the flame alive uh, that, that goes throughout the entire five-hour event. Uh, I don't know what anyone told you, but we brought you here to spoil things. <laughs> so don't be hiding things. But uh -huh. as you can see, the multiverse is vast and complex, and a lot of people are intimidated by that, man. But we're going to show you all how simple and straightforward it really is. We brought in Chancellor Agard from Entertainment Weekly to walk us through the state of the multiverse. Chancellor, bring out your pointer, man. <laughs> Well, the multiverse is down six Earths after this uh, episode, including Earth 2, which faded to dust in the Arrow Season 8 premiere. Tonight, we started on Earth 89. So wait, hold on. It's gone. It's gone. It's gone already, yeah. Okay. So we started on Earth 89, where we saw Robert Wall. Robert Wall's back! From the Tim Burton Batman movies. And then? Gone. Gone. 
and presumably along with Michael Keaton. From there, we travel across the Cameoverse to Earth-9, home of DC Universe's Titans. And? In the first ever Arrow, oh, that's gone too, yes. In the first ever Arrowverse uh, crossover the streaming show, but they're dead already, so. Gone, what was the point? From there, Earth-X went next, and then Earth-66 was the next to go, along with Burt Ward, who played Robin in the classic Batman series of 1966. So absolutely cruel, holy dead, Robin. And then the antimatter wave started traveling towards Argo, which is where Superman, Lois Lane, Baby Jonathan, and Supergirl's mom, Allure, were living. But she's dead now. Luckily, Clark and Lois aren't, though, because the Harbinger teleported them to Earth-38, and then Baby Jonathan zipped off in an escape pod. At the same time, Harbinger then traveled to Earth-1, where she collected Oliver, Mia, Ray, Sarah, Kate, Barry, and brought them all over to Earth-38. Meanwhile, Sarah, Lois, and Brainy traveled to Earth-16 to find baby Jonathan, who was in a future version of Star City with old man Oliver Queen. After all that, though, Earth-38 was still wiped out by the Anti-Monitor. Luckily, though, our heroes managed to save about a couple billion people and themselves and bring them all the way back to Earth-1, which is where we left them. Okay, that covers everything. Everything, yeah. Give it up for Chancellor. That was actually pretty damn amazing. All right, man, I'm sweating. That was a lot to take in, man. Before we go further, I want to thank LaMonica Garrett for joining us. <laughs> Excellent job. When we return, we mourn our fallen heroes and hear some very interesting fan predictions. Back in a flash with more Crisis Aftermath. Welcome back, my dear super friends. This is Crisis Aftermath, and I'm Kevin Smith. We are delighted to have the executive producer of Supergirl, Robert Rovner, here with us. Man, how you doing, Robert? I'm super. You got a lot of food. <laughs> oh, my <laughs> lord. Well written. Like all <laughs> great you. sagas, families are central to the DC Universe, especially its most famous couple, Superman and Lois Lane. Tonight, they had their world completely upended. Let's look. Quickly, quickly. Let's set a course for Earth. Hopefully they'll have enough time to stop this wave before it hits. Where are the rest? There are no others. Only this one. You know, it seems like Kryptonians are always sending their kids off in a space pod. <laughs> is this just a rite of passage at this point? Is this what, what they do? Nobody ever told them, like, there could be another plan. No, they should have they prepared more, built some more pods, but it's unfortunately true. it didn't work out that way. The whole planet should just be a series of pods ready to go <laughs> at any moment so everyone can leave. But no, it's always just a, big enough for a baby. What was it like to kind of jump back and re-examine uh, a moment that is huge, iconic in, in comic book history, but then put through this different prism? Very daunting for us to, you know, we wanted to pay homage to the uh, canon and to, you know, we're all, a lot of our... Um, our inspiration comes from the Donner movies, and so we wanted to pay homage to that as well. We're really excited to have this opportunity to show it through Kal-El's eyes and uh, to do it with Kal-El and, and Lois. It's always nice to include uh, Superman, but like, is the inability to play with the Superman IP is kind of where Supergirl came from, and you guys built something really wonderful, like in a world where it's like, oh, we can't touch the big guy. We can tell every Superman story we ever dreamed about telling, through the prism of Supergirl, and in doing so, expanded and diversified the Arrowverse. Um, what do we see happening in, uh, for the Maiden of Might uh, in the rest of the series here? Is she like the cover of uh, one of the very famous uh, issues of Crisis on Infinite Earths? Is she going to be winding up in somebody's arms, lifeless? I can't give any. Come on, Robert. <laughs> but I, she has a very emotional journey in the. the the rest of Crisis, you know, I think one of the things that happens in this hour, she sees Argo destroyed. Mm. And so she really is on a mission to try and save that. You know, she's always a character that's full of a lot of hope. And so she wants to, uh, you know, both stop the inevitable and correct what the anti-monitor is up to, which is not good. Can I just say this moment with Clark and Lois when he was like, where's the other ships? And she's like, there aren't any. And I was like, oh, no. <laughs> I was like, can, this, can they just win once in a while? <laughs> this man is so selfless. Like, he went off to have his family on another planet. Like, just let him have this moment. Of course, they came back, but 
Uh, I also think I'm excited because in the comics, Alexander, uh, you know, actually has some part. And I know that Jonathan stays a baby, but I'm like, there's no way the super baby isn't like popping in. Like, even if it's just to like put punch, <laughs> punch someone, I'm sure the super baby will pop up somewhere. All the heroes in the Arrowverse are always such strong leads, but you guys got some gold in Tyler. Tyler's absolutely wonderful. We caught up with Tyler, uh, AK Clark Kent, and got his thoughts on the Man of Steel becoming the Dad of Steel. Check it out. Jonathan really has your eyes, huh? <laughs> I'll take it. It's a new realization, I think, for him of how fragile life really is, and not because he's afraid of losing his, but he's afraid of not being there for his son. So it's definitely something new to take on and uh, a new perspective to look at the world through, but um, it's, been, it's been a fun, fun challenge. How does being a father affect Superman? I think it really raises the stakes for him. You know, not only is he uh, trying to protect the universe uh, for his son, but he, he really, uh, I think, feels much more deeply what he could lose. They've lost their baby in time and space many, many times. Should Lois and Clark also lose custody? Uh, I would say no. I mean, I don't yeah, think no, Kryptonians no. should ever be allowed to have children. Because no, <laughs> they don't know what to do with them. They're like, hey, there's an earthquake. Let's throw the baby into space. <laughs> I also love that they send them to humans. Like, he's actually super powered, but they're giving the super powered little individual to the least responsible people that can yeah. handle it. This will work out. Send them to primates. <laughs> Crisis on Infinite Earths may have just begun, but we already have to say some goodbyes, man. Let's take a moment to pay tribute to all those humans, metahumans, and entire civilizations that we lost tonight. Robert, I want to thank you so much for joining us, giving us a little of uh, the inside dirt, man. Don't go anywhere, because when we come back, we'll get the scoop on the Arrowverse's newest hero, Batwoman. We were crypt on long before we were crypt off. Stick around for more Crisis Aftermath. Welcome back to Crisis Aftermath, one of an infinite number of Crisis on Infinite Earths after shows currently airing in the known universes. I'm one of your infinite number of hosts, Kevin Smith Prime. When we first see Batwoman, she's busy kicking people's butts in Gotham. So when Harbinger teleports her to Earth 38 to help prevent the destruction of the multiverse, it's a little disorienting. Let's look. Kara, where are we and what just happened? Um, you're on Earth 38. There was... <clears throat> That rabbit was about to talk. This one speaks to rabbits. Well, it's okay, because we're all on the same side. Are we? Because I don't know them. But you know me. And if you were brought here with all these other heroes, it's probably because we need you. I trust everyone in this room with my life, including you. Well, I guess you should all just call me Kate. Oh, that's awesome. Joining us now is the showrunner of CW's Batwoman, Caroline Drees, man. How are you? I'm good, thank you. So good to have you here. What's going on in Batwoman's life before she's called in for this giant epic? Yeah, uh, Batwoman has been spending most of the season trying to convince herself and everyone that she loves that her sister, Alice, who's the big villain of the season, mm -hmm. that she can be redeemed, that there's some humanity left in her. And that's and her joker. Yeah, that's sort of like her crazy maniacal yep, yep, Joker yep. counterpart. And it's also her twin sister. And so Batwoman is convinced, look, I can save her. She's worth the time. She's good. She's got good deep down in her. And in the last episode before Crisis, 
Alice does the unthinkable. She kills somebody very close to Kate and proves that she actually probably isn't redeemable. And that right now, as Kate's entering this crisis, she's starting to wonder, you know, should I put my hope in humanity? Is it worth it? And, you know, am I capable of bringing out the good in people? What am I actually doing? How does she feel amongst these, like, super-powered individuals as someone who is fighting without superpowers? Yeah, it's tricky. You know, I think of being a superhero when you have the fate of the world riding on your shoulders. It's mostly about just showing up to fight no. the fight. And Whoa. does she know if a battering's gonna work on a shadow demon? You know, right. she's never done it before. But that's what makes her special, is that she's willing mm -hmm. to do it. Um, anybody who loves to play uh, in this field dreams about playing with Gotham City IP. Yes. Yeah. What has it been like to run around and do what you want with it's, Gotham City? It is such a gift. Obviously, Gotham is the second biggest character on our show. And we've had such a fun time tapping into some of the more familiar characters and villains. And we're also conscientious that the audience has a certain expectation when they see these bad guys that they've seen a million times and they, they want a little spin on it. Right. And we want to try to tell stories that haven't been seen before. So. Mm -hmm. There's just such a vast encyclopedia of characters, and they're all so weird and colorful. And the the fun part about Gotham is that the crazy is built into the DNA of the city. And mm. so she's going up against these villains who are just as strong as she is. Has there, and this is just inside baseball, has there been any villain that like, you can't touch that? Uh, yes. A lot, right? <laughs> uh, uh, I yeah. imagine you could speak to that as well. Yeah. I, I'm sure that, uh, <laughs> I, I'm sure there's no billion dollar movie uh, of a character that uh, <laughs> is related to this decision at all. Oh, like, yeah. you know, but the, the, the fact of the matter is the Arrowverse has proven that, like, you can do big budget storytelling yeah. with vast cast, just as adventurous, just as captures the imagination as they do, like, in the cinema as well. And it seems to me from the outside, in the beginning, it was very, like, you can only use this guy and this guy and don't even reference this stuff. It seems to be. Getting, loosening up. It's, you know, I always look at it as the glass is half full. You know, we never in a million years when we first started the Arrowverse thought we were ever Superman, Batwoman, Gotham City, mm -hmm. forget about it. Like, right. so uh, this, it's all a gift. I want to thank Caroline Dries for coming to join us. Thank you for representing Gotham in the Arrowverse. Thank you. It's big thing, big thing. And when we come back, I go head to head against my podcast co-host, and primary life rival Mark Bernardin in a game of DC trivia. Keep it right here, man. Same bad time, same bad channel. Welcome back to Crisis Aftermath. Joining us here on the stage of Destiny is my friend and Fat Man Beyond co-host, Mark Bernard, and welcome, Mark. Hey! How are you? I'm amazing. Now, it's confusing for the home viewer because Danny's in my seat now. That's because she's going to be the games master for a little competition we like to call Crisis Colon After Feud. Thank you, Kevin. I am going to ask a series of trivia questions about the DC Universe. If you have an answer, please raise your specially made crisis paddle, and I'll call on you. Trash talking is encouraged. Oh, thank God. Extra points will be assigned for making the other person cry. Oh, I the, brought tissues. <laughs> the winner will be awarded the prize of never shutting up about it. So, gentlemen, are you ready? Yes. All right, first question. In The Flash, Harrison Wells founded Star Labs. What does Star stand for? You might have wanted to work up to the hard ones, right. Annie. Yes, Mark. Uh, scientific Technical Advanced Research. Oh, yeah, but there's an A in there, friend. Advanced. Oh, yeah, you said that. Okay, never mind. Did I'm it, sorry. Did I get a point? <laughs> yeah, you got it. Spelling! <laughs> I didn't know that. All right, all right, moving on, moving on. This is multiple choice. Yes. Hmm. Arrowverse fans are very familiar with the concept of parallel Earths, but the idea was first introduced with what DC Comics superhero? Is it A, Wonder Woman, B, Green Lantern, or C, Dr. Fate? Ooh. Mark. Green Lantern. That is incorrect. Oh. You can steal, Kevin. Yes. 
Uh, I'm gonna go Dr. Fate. Oh, you're both wrong. We're, we're idiots. It is Wonder Woman, Diana Prince herself. You know, that just shows our gender bias, doesn't it? Yeah, it does. We're like, how'd you be a man in bed to the multiverse? <laughs> Apparently not. Uh, Argo's now destroyed shield <laughs> was made of Harunel, aka Black Kryptonite, back when Supergirl used it to defeat Rain. It split her in two and sent her other half to what? Inhospitable land. Um, Fortress of Desolation? No, I don't know. Apocalypse? No. It is Kaznia. Okay, okay. Danny, this is really depressing. <laughs> this is all I got in life is knowing about this stuff, and I don't know it anymore. Um, For the record, I'm winning. Yeah, you are. <laughs> <It's> true. <laughs> You're real, you should be hosting this thing. <laughs> <laughs> really okay. making me look bad. Okay, if Robert Wolf from 1989's Batman is found on Earth 89, and the Flash from 1990 TV show is found on Earth 90, mm. on what number Earth will you find a Mr. Freeze that looks and sounds like Arnold Schwarzenegger? I'm gonna say 97, Earth 97. Can you please raise your paddle, <laughs> sir? <laughs> Earth 97. <laughs> That is correct. Yes! That is that correct. One. I remember the 90s. <laughs> and I remember those nipples. Okay, here we go. Mm. How did Oliver Queen die in the 1990s comic version? That's Chuck Dixon's fault. Chuck Dixon killed him. Um, Oliver had his hands in a device, an exploding device, and if he removed one of his hands, it would have set off the bomb and exploded the yes. plane. Superman was there, and he was like, I, we can do this, but I would have to, he intimates that we have to laser off uh, Oliver's arm, which then would have made Oliver look like the Dark Knight Returns Oliver Queen, who only had one arm. So while we were reading the books, we're like, oh, the future's here! And then instead, Oliver chose to die. Yes. Kevin, that incredibly long answer is correct. Yes! <laughs> so you are actually our winner. I'm the filibuster winner! <laughs> I just said a lot of words and I won, man. Figures. Thank you for making me look good on TV. I try. Thank you for asking me those questions. You guys did very well. Uh, when we come back, we're gonna take a glimpse into the future of Crisis on Infinite Earths after you go through this wormhole of infinite commercials. Welcome back to Crisis Aftermath. We got Mark Guggenheim back out for this final act, and we are 24 hours away from the next installment of Crisis on Infinite Earths, and all we know is that anything can happen. Quantum towers shot out of the ground. Burt Ward got killed after two <laughs> seconds in a very clever line. So we went to New York Comic Con, and we asked our beloved fans what they think is gonna go down. Check it out. I am so excited for Crisis on Infinite Earths. So many different characters from so many different multiverses. I think it's going to set up a lot to bring Gotham City into the fold and all of those characters and really be able to kind of set them up for the Batwoman show, which I'm excited for as well. I really hope we find out what happened to Bruce Wayne. I would really like to see Sarah Lance reunite with the new Black Canary. I'm really excited to see Brandon Roth wear the cape. I felt he was an underappreciated Superman. Maybe a clash between Supergirl and Batwoman and see how they go up against each other. I do think Flash is going to be leading the whole group. Maybe Batwoman will take the lead. No, I don't think so. <laughs> Why not? I know. <laughs> boy, oh boy, everyone's got an opinion, man. Uh, were any of them right, Mark? Did any of them you know, hit? There, there were a couple of things in there that we, we hit. When you're writing the shows, when the shows are airing and whatnot, um, you, do you pay attention to the internet? And yeah. Yeah, actually. Do uh, they ever guess in advance? Always. Like, always. Really? Yeah, so they figure it out? The, the Twitter is like crowdsourcing the writer's room. So, right. yes, people are, are constantly, uh, you know, predicting stuff. So you're like, oh, my God, they got that. Yes. Oh, no, it's like, it's, it's incredibly annoying. Uh, <laughs> you know, at the same time. They're, annoying, you know, but at the same time, it's flattering because they're like, they're all well, over they're it. They're thinking about it, yeah. you know, and they're, and they're smart. The internet's smart, man. Where do you fall on the scale of fandom of Arrowverse? How deep and hard do you go, Danny? Oh, man. I mean, I feel like I've been here since day one, so it's been so cool to see all these characters on, you know, that, uh, honestly, you also grow with them. Mm. Like, you talked about redemption, and I feel like we've grown with Oliver. You know, we've grown with Barry. And one thing that I didn't really get to touch on was that Sarah, that moment with Sarah and older Oliver, mm. where she says, you know, you're a good man. And I think when the other Oliver dies and he says, Barry, you're the best of us, it's because he always discredits himself. Right. Yeah, you know, he's had so much growth. And it's like, I just love that moment of her 
her giving him his redemption of you you too are also a good man and that is what all the rest of us see you've been watching these shows since the jump since yes. the jump yeah i was i was a og arrow fan and it's, it's, it's funny because it's, it's hard to still stay as passionate about things as you do as you get older, as the show gets older, mm. but these shows are always like a renewable resource. Like they always find ways to, to, to seduce you back in. And, they always, and sometimes it's the crossovers, sometimes it's the big character moments, and sometimes it's just these, these people that you kind of love, watching them do these things over and over and over again. And yeah, you just kind of, I, I like that love. It's true, I love these shows, like I don't care if Barry faces a villain every year that I know is gonna be speed-based. <laughs> <laughs> like, what else is he gonna do? I appreciate that it's a family affair and it always has been, and every one of the Arrowverse series ultimately does that, man. It's about the family you have and the family you build. It's fantastic. I wanna thank all my guests, Mark Guggenheim, Danny Fernandez, Mark Bernardin, Kat McNamara, LaMonica Garrett, Robert Rovner, and Caroline Dries, man. Thank you all for coming in, giving us a little addition of the dirt. We're going to be back on Tuesday night for more giddy superhero chatter after Crisis Hour 3. Man, I'm going to hunker down in my fortress of solitude. You know what that means. Until then, make sure you come back, man. The whole universe is at stake. See you next time on Crisis Aftermath.